for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in. In these challenging times, it's a thrill to be able to present virtual editions of our programs and to use live streaming to create a kind of digital stage that can serve Town Hall's community of curious and engaged Seattleites. Folks well beyond Seattle too, we're finding. Like anyone who's willing to stare or talk into their computers right now, some for the very first time, I want to especially thank Dar Jamail for helping us keep the conversation aloft tonight at Town Hall. The broadcast this evening is taking place on Crowdcast, as well as our Facebook and YouTube pages. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page, and you can enable real-time closed captioning by clicking the CC button in the bottom right corner of that video player. The video will also be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Uh, Dar's presentation, you know, I should have asked, but it'll typically last 30 plus minutes. Afterwards, he'll take your questions. We'd ask that you submit your questions in the ask a question button uh, on the Crowdcast platform. Uh, afterwards, we'll select and pose questions, although we cannot guarantee that Dar will be able to get to every question. We will try to get to as many as possible. Upcoming programs uh, in just the next few weeks include Michael Shermer, Frank Wilderson, David Sachs, Welcome to Night Vale, Lulu Miller, Kirk Bloodsworth, Sister Helen Prejean, the return of our annual Engage UW Science Series, uh, as well as more installments of Earshot Jazz Live from the Forum, and soon to be announced, an evening with Samantha Irby and Angela Garbas. We're adding new programs every day, as well as new events released in podcast form, and Many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form already. So if you go to our media tab on the homepage uh, over the coming weeks, Town Hall will continue to provide not only ways to stay plugged into the present, but plenty more rabbit holes to climb down from the past. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arno G. Matulski Science Series in particular is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, the Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the taxpayers of Washington State. But as most of you know, Town Hall is a member-supported organization and is truly our nearly 6,000 members who make this program possible. And I want to thank all of our members who are watching tonight. Uh, last, I guess the second finally, is that you should know that all those rumors about the vulnerability of nonprofits right now, they're absolutely true. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large are under significant strain. And so we hope you will consider a gift during this difficult time, perhaps by becoming a member yourself uh, through this website or by making a donation using one of the URLs in the comments on your respective feeds this evening. And while we're talking economic data, um, I should let you know, or I should point out the fact that our beloved independent businesses in this community are feeling the squeeze as well. Uh, if you wanna deepen your understanding of tonight's subject, since that's the very thing that's brought us together, and in so doing, support our wonderful partners at Third Place Books, I'll politely suggest that you use the buy the book button on our event page um, or the URL that we're offering in the comment threads in lieu of, oh, say, the local retail behemoth that used to specialize in books. Town Hall Hearts third place. All right, then. Darja Mail is a truth out staff reporter who for a decade plus reported from across the Middle East, including Syria, Lebanon, Turkey and Jordan. He was also one of the few unembedded journalists to report extensively from Iraq during the 2003 invasion. Beyond truth out, his work has been seen in The Guardian, Foreign Policy and Focus, The Monde, uh, The Huffington Post, The Nation, The Independent, and Al Jazeera, among other publications. Jamail is the author of 2007's Behind the Green Zone, Beyond the Green Zone, sorry, Dispatches from an Unembedded Journalist, The Will to Resist, Soldiers Who Refused to Fight in Iraq and Afghanistan from 2009, and 2014's The Mass Destruction of Iraq, Why It Is Happening and Who, it, who Is Responsible, is co-written with William Rivers Pitt. His book, The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dar Jamail. Thanks very much, Ware. And I wanna thank Seattle Town Hall for uh, having me uh, speak again, obviously under very different circumstances this time than uh, what I experienced over in Seattle, actually doing this in, in, in person at the time. Um, I want to start with sort of a climate overview because given COVID-19, all of us being rather obsessed with following that news and for very good reasons for our health and that of our loved ones, I wanted to start with a climate overview, but pick this up 
pretty much where the book ended. Uh, this book was published in January 2019, and I wanted to just read an excerpt uh, to bring people up to speed on uh, an overview to kind of give you an idea of how rapidly the climate crisis is progressing. And this is going on, of course, in real time now uh, amidst the COVID-19 crisis. And I'll come back to COVID-19 after this. Um, so this is a little bit that I just want to share for a piece that I, I wrote for the nation um, um, just this past December. So just a week after my book, The End of Ice, was released, a team of glaciologists from UC Irvine showed that over the course of four decades, the total mass loss of ice from Antarctica had accelerated a pace six times faster than it had during just the 1980s. By July, scientists were trying to determine if glacial melting there would become irreversible. Later in that same year, researchers in Greenland told the BBC that they were astounded by the rate of acceleration in the melting there and expressed fear for coastal cities in the future. One of the scientists said, so we're losing Greenland. It's really a question of how fast. And he said, Greenland is already facing a melting, quote, death sentence. The loss of the Greenland ice sheet alone will raise global sea levels 20 feet. Another study warned that if current warming trends continue, and there is, of course, no reason to think they will do anything other than accelerate, the mighty Himalaya mountains could lose most of their glaciers by 2100 as they warm up by eight degrees Fahrenheit. This would bring radical disruptions to food and water supplies for upwards of 1.5 billion people, in addition to a refugee crisis of staggering proportions. As last winter gave way to spring across the Northern Hemisphere, it emerged that 2018 was the fourth warmest year ever recorded, with the only warmer years being 2015, 2016, and 2017. Um, last year was on track to become the next fourth warmest year ever recorded. Uh, is another way of saying that the last five years are the hottest five years since record keeping began. And I can say now that even since that was published, it just came out last week that numerous meteorological agencies around the planet said that this year, 2020, is already currently on track to again become the hottest year ever recorded. So we can up that statistic to the last six years, including this one uh, being the six hottest years ever recorded. At the same time, Excuse me, last year, uh, the UK's Met Office announced that we're living in what will most likely be the warmest decade ever recorded. Meanwhile, the global food supply chain, and this is again all pre COVID, was already under severe threat from an ongoing and catastrophic loss of biodiversity. Quote Around the world, the library of life that has evolved over billions of years, our biodiversity is being destroyed, poisoned, polluted, invaded, fragmented plundered, drained, and burned at a rate not seen in human history, Ireland's president, Michael Higgins, said at a biodiversity conference in Dublin. He continued, if we were coal miners, we'd be up to our waists in dead canaries. Climate disruption-fueled extreme weather patterns are also adding to the risk of a global food crisis, as research revealed how multiple bread baskets could fail at the same time. An analysis published in the scientific journal Biological Conservation reports that plummeting insect numbers globally could lead to the collapse of nature. Our work reveals dramatic rates of decline that may lead to the extinction of 40% of the world's insect species over the next few decades, reads the abstract of the study. It warned that insects could vanish within one century, and the researchers remind us that insects are, quote, essential for the proper functioning of all ecosystems and that the current trends are disrupting, to a varying degree, the invaluable pollination, natural pest control, food resources, nutrient recycling, and decomposition services that many insects provide. To put it simply, when the insects are gone, so will be humans. And right now we are on a trajectory to lose most of the insects on Earth within 100 years. The Amazon rainforest burned at a record pace in 2019, seeing an 80% increase in wildfires compared to the same period the previous year. Smoke from the burning rainforest darkened the skies over Sao Paulo, more than 1,700 miles from the fires, which were so large that their smoke also covered parts of Bolivia, Peru, and Paraguay. 
Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, whom I spent extensive time with in the Amazon rainforest, warned in an editorial in the journal Science Advances, quote, we believe that negative synergies between deforestation, climate change, and widespread use of fire indicate a tipping point for the Amazon system to flip to non-forest ecosystems in eastern, southern, sub southern and central Amazonia at 20 to 25 percent deforestation. The World Wildlife Fund, which he used to head, estimated that 17 percent of the Amazon has been lost in the last five decades. The fires of 2019 have brought us that much closer to the tipping point Lovejoy warned of. In fact, we could have already passed that tipping point. And I'll add that right now we know clearly that habitat loss and human encroachment is is arguably right alongside climate disruption one of the lead causes of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Meanwhile, things went from bad to worse for the Great Barrier Reef. Not only is the reef subjected to ongoing bleaching events happening at a pace far beyond the natural weight, rate at which they occur, climate crisis-fueled rain events caused the reef to experience smothering of its coral when floodwaters drained onto it, bringing soil runoff with them. Some scientists referred to this as the nail in the coffin for the existence of the largest coral reef on earth, which then received another nail from the Australian government shortly after that when it decided to give the green light to dumping one million tons of sludge across the reef. Less than six weeks after that, a study was published showing that the reef had suffered an 89% collapse in new coral after its bleaching events of 2016 and 2017. This means that as the reef dies, it is unable to come back to life as the waters in which it lived continues to con continue to warm. Sediment-filled runoff runoff covers it, and assaults from the Australian government continue. And also, right now, as I speak with you, the reef is is at the tail end of its single worst coral bleaching event to date, and that happened after I wrote what I'm reading you right now. Meanwhile, uh, this past December, a study showed how the planet's oceans are rapidly deoxygenating, with some areas in the tropics having already lost 40 to 50 percent of their oxygen. To make matters worse, a landmark report showed that no matter how much emissions are cut, extreme sea level events that used to occur once per century will happen every single year by 2050. A previous study had already warned that unless dramatic emission cuts were made, and coastal defenses against sea level rise dramatically strengthened, coastal lands that currently house 300 million people will flood at least once every year by 2050. An Oxfam report published last December showed that already one person every two seconds is being forced from their homes due to the climate crisis. My concerns about what was happening in the Arctic regarding increasing release of methane have been proven out as earlier spring rains there this past spring have been thawing the permafrost at an accelerated rate, hence releasing more methane than ever. In fact, permafrost across the Canadian Arctic is now thawing out 70 years faster than had been earlier estimated, according to Dr. Vladimir Romanovsky, who I spoke with for my book. Another historic event occurred last year, this one in the form of the country of Iceland holding a funeral for the first glacier the country lost to the climate crisis. A plaque left on the location of the vanished gla glacier offers, quote, a letter to the future with the message, quote, this monument is to acknowledge that we know what is happening and what needs to be done. Only you know if we did it, end quote. Humans are now injecting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a rate nine to 10 times higher than that during the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, PETM, global warming event 56 million years ago, which acidified the oceans and drove large numbers of marine species to extinction. Quote, the fact that we could reach warming equivalent to the PETM very quickly within the next few hundred years is terrifying, Larissa DeSantis, a paleontologist with Vanderbilt University said of the study, while geophysicist Gabriel Brown with the University of Utah observed, we don't have much in the way of geologic examples to draw from in understanding how the world responds to that kind of perturbation. Three months after that study was published for the first time in human history, Earth's atmospheric concentration of CO2 reached 415 parts per million. 
Less than two weeks after that, the International Energy Agency announced that global carbon emissions set a record in 2018, increasing nearly 2% over the previous year to set a record of 33.1 billion tons. By November, the UN's World Meteorological Organization reported that the concentration of climate heating greenhouse gases had hit another all-time high and announced there was, quote, no sign of a slowdown, let alone a decline. The Trump administration began the formal withdrawal of the U.S. from the Paris Climate Agreement, and New York states claimed that ExxonMobil had misled investors for years about the risk of climate disruption was rejected in court. All of that just in 2019, unfortunately. And uh, things have continued to pace now well into 2020. And as we, as we speak, we have a record-breaking heat wave uh, uh, across the, the southwestern United States. So I want to talk now about the relationship, a very direct relationship that I see between the climate crisis and COVID-19. Um, as I mentioned earlier, essentially a lot of the same causes, uh, which is basically industrial scale assault by humans, by, by global capitalism on the very life providing systems of the planet. Uh, including uh, animals and insects. And um, in, in writing my book, I, I came across, you know, I had, I kind of came into the conclusion of the book and was looking for how to uh, really understand and how to process internally uh, this overwhelming amount of information and, and the trauma that comes with it about what is, what is, it's really not so much what's happening to the planet as, as it is what is being done to the planet. And I came across a Native American scholar. Uh, he's passed away now, but his name's uh, Jack Forbes. He wrote a book called Columbus and Other Cannibals. And in the book, he, he uses a term called Waitiko, which means cannibal, uh, uh, for what he calls Waitiko disease. And he calls it a sickness of exploitation. And cannibalism, as Forbes describes it, is the consuming of another's life for one's own private purpose or profit. So Forbes said, quote, imperialism and the exploitation and exploitation are forms of cannibalism. And in fact, are precisely those forms of cannibalism which are most diabolical or evil. And so it's this way Tico disease that has caused the climate crisis, some, just a few of the impacts of this that I just shared with you, and I go into much greater detail in my book, but it's that same disease that caused human encroachment, deforestation, uh, human-caused fires to burn land and go into places of the planet and, and, and then cause this exposure between humans and animals that created the conditions for something like the coronavirus to occur leading to the disease, the disease of COVID-19. It's the same disease, Waitiko disease. And there's a story now that speaks to really the myth of human supremacy that was recently shared uh, with me by a Native American elder. And this is a story that was told to him by another elder. And it's a story that that person received 60 years ago at which point at that time, this was believed to be a very old story. And so I'd like to read this story to you now. Before the beginning, there was a vast darkness. Creator asked the non-human mother to bring forms of life into the darkness. So she created the earth and the animals. Some, some say she sang it all into being. After a very long time of living very well, the animals wanted companions. So they asked for the humans to be made. The humans were made, and for a while, the animals watched the humans walk around, not knowing how to be here. So they called a council with Eagle. They all agreed to teach the humans how to be here in a good way. So they did that. Some even sacrificed their lives so humans could survive. And the teaching was that the humans should only take an animal's life in respect and need, and that they must offer tobacco and give thanks using feathers, the Eagle, gave them for that purpose. All went well for many generations as the humans learned from the animals and they could listen to each other and they lived a good life together. Then some humans were born who invented greed 
and they taught it to their children and to others, and so on down the line, until the humans began taking many more lives than they needed to survive. They killed and hoarded and bought and sold, and the animals were in great danger. So the animals called for another council with Eagle. They decided together to cook, cook up a big pot of disease and give it to the humans, and then they did this. Many humans died, and the animals came into the human towns and places and watched closely to see if they would remember the original instruction. And when the humans saw that, that the disease came from the animals, they listened and remembered and changed their ways, going back to the teachings, respecting the animals and their sacrifices. All went well again for many generations, for a very long time. Then some humans came along who invented greed again, and the same thing that happened before happened again. But this time the greed grew very, very quickly, and almost all the animals were killed, and the diminishing number left were in very grave danger of completely disappearing from the earth they were, they were made to live on. So they called another council with Eagle, and after much concerned talk, they all decided together to cook up a very big pot of disease to give to the humans. But this time, the disease would drive all the humans off the earth so the animals could live in peace again. And this life of mutual respect was the original uh, intention. Again, I think it's very important to hear this indigenous story and remember again the fallacy of believing in the myth of human supremacy over the planet. And I think it, this story also reminds us to uh, really sit quietly now in this time and start reflecting on how to better live uh, with the planet and on the planet. Um, there's another thing that I wanted to share tonight where a group of friends and I had a gathering recently and we uh, essentially did a, a sort of creative visualization exercise. And one of the things that came out of this was that the industrial growth society, i.e. global capitalism, i.e. Waitiko disease, was right now being pinned down to a stop, forced to stop by COVID-19. And whenever the this Waitiko disease global capitalist system tries to come back to life, as we're seeing now uh, in states that are essentially putting human lives uh, behind the profit motive and try to open back up. And even though that uh, this, this global pandemic is, is still at the early stage and far from being over, and there's no vaccine in sight yet, that essentially what we could see is that the harder that this system, the global capitalist system tries to push itself back into being uh, actualized, the more it's going to be pushed back down and forced to stay down by this global pandemic. And I think that's an important thing to watch as we go forward from this moment in time. So this crisis now and all of us being forced to stop and for our own safety and those that we care about, I think it brings up very, very deep questions for all of us to ask ourselves about how are we going to adapt to all of these layers and what kind of quality of life do we want at this time? And um, on that note, I think I want to share a quote because I, I actually live in the country and it's very sheltering in place for me is relatively easy right now in that I can go for walks in the woods. I can go uh, do work in a rather large garden that I share with some landmates or chop firewood or that kind of thing. And so sometimes people ask, well, what about those of us, i.e. the majority of us who live in cities and can't just go do that kind of thing? And so I want to read a quote that speaks to that. It's by Scott Russell Sanders, and it's from a book called Staying Put, Making Home in a Restless World. He writes, there are no privileged locations. If you stay put, your place may become a holy center, not because it gives you special access to the divine, but because in your stillness, you hear what might be heard anywhere. All there is to see can be seen from anywhere in the universe, if you know how to look. And the influence of the entire universe converges on every spot. 
so in that spirit, what I've been doing during this lockdown uh, here in Washington State is is I've had, like everybody else, really to adjust to this. Uh, everything has slowed down. It's I found it hard to anything that I felt needed to be done quickly. It just wasn't going to happen at that pace. That everything is slowing down, and so I've had to kind of watch myself have to decouple from that insane pace that's forced upon us by this global capitalist system. And one of the things that I've seen is that um, it's forced me to be more in right relationship to the earth. It's forced me to really walk my talk regarding what am I going to do personally regarding the climate crisis. Flying is not an option. It's just not safe and won't be for the indefinite future. Being local, buying things locally, buying locally produced things, growing more of my own food, getting off dollars and starting to find ways to trade and barter with people, walking around and meeting my neighbors and getting to know them on a first name basis. This is how we've known for decades now that if we're going to take seriously the proper reaction that we would have to have to really mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis, this is exactly what we need to be doing. And this is exactly the kind of response globally, globally that we should have been having to the climate crisis ages ago. So the question is, we know that there won't be any going back to normal because normal before was always completely unsustainable because normal before was based on an ongoing assault on the planet and her systems and all the other beings. So we don't want to go back to normal. It doesn't make sense and it's not gonna make sense to the planet. And the beauty of this time, I feel, is it's giving us a time to really start to think deeply about living in right relationship to the planet. So uh, I want to conclude with talking about something that I, I mentioned in the end of my book, which is uh, a very, very key difference between a uh, settler colonialist mindset and an indigenous mindset. And the settler colonialist mindset believes that we have rights. Um, most of us li listening are uh, intimately acquainted with this idea that you know we, we have certain rights. But a more indigenous perspective is that we're born onto the planet, each of us, with two primary obligations. The first of which is to uh, serve future generations of all species. And the second is to be as good a stewards as we can possibly be to the planet. And so with all of this overwhelming information, whether it be about the climate crisis or the dire impacts on so many levels from the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's it's very easy to get overwhelmed, and and I just want like to share something this with people that it's it's very easy for me even now to get up and put this into practice each day. If I start to ask, um, you know, remember what my obligations are, and then use my imagination and get creative and just figure out, okay, how how can I best try to fulfill these two primary obligations of service. Because if I if I go into the day and go into the future now on this very, very troubled planet with that mindset, then I stand a lot better chance of of living in much better relation to the earth, which just so happens to be how we should have always been living in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, Dar. So uh, I, I'll kick things off with uh, sort of a simple question. And by the way, every, sorry, everybody, that I'm covered in blue suddenly. Um, uh, what Can you describe a little bit? And I stepped away from the camera for a few minutes, but describe the beats that you covered for this book, how you assembled the story that became The End of Ice, because it wasn't obviously simply uh, a story about about the reef and the pole, but how did you sort of assemble the narrative and the point of view that that's born out in the book? Yeah, thanks, Ware. Um, I decided that I wanted to write a book uh, that would bring people the best I could uh, in a narrative to places on the planet where the climate crisis was happening the most abruptly and the most 
uh, obvious. So I, I wanted to go to these places and write about it in a emotional and visceral way and, and as accurately as I could. So I also went with, excuse me, leading scientists. So I, I got to go to the Amazon rainforest with Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, the, the godfather of biodiversity who, who coined the term. Um, I got to go to Sequoia National Park with a leading forester with U.S. Geological Survey. I went out on glaciers in Glacier National Park in Alaska, uh, both those places with USGS glaciologists, and, and then um, the Great Barrier Reef with uh, marine scientists from Australia and places like this in order to kind of bring to people, here's where it's happening, this is what it looks and feels like, and then plenty of scientific data to, to back that up because I, I knew full well that most people couldn't travel to a lot of these places, let alone all of them. And so I, I wanted to do my best to bring that home to people so that they could kind of go there in the book and there's a picture to lead each chapter and really give them a very personal uh, experience of not just what's, what's happening there scientifically, but what it looks, sees, smells, and and feels like uh, to watch these magnificent places uh, change so dramatically. Can you tell us a little bit about your decision to, um, in the middle of a career that was, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, um, formed around um, as a war correspondent, as a reporter from the Middle East? Um, was there a, a personal epiphany or was there a, what's the sort of genesis of, of stepping into into this topic, into this issue? Well, the the book really was, the, the seed for this book was planted long before I became a journalist and, and certainly long before I became a war reporter. I was living in Alaska and I moved up there in 1996 and got heavily involved in mountaineering and uh, was literally volunteering with the National Park Service on Denali climbing and helping do rescues from time to time uh, when the Iraq war break out, broke out. So up until that time, from night between 96 and 2003, I was going out and doing a lot of climbing in Alaska and seeing firsthand, even though I wasn't studying climate, the climate crisis and was aware of the change, though, just because, especially in a place like Alaska, it's happening so fast and so dramatically. So um, that seed was in there. I knew that these glaciers were receding. I knew that there were already major disruptions in climate patterns across the state that I was absolutely in love with. And so that seed was planted, but I wasn't a journalist. And then I, I went and became a war reporter for the better part of 10 years. And then all, all the while knowing what was happening back in my home state. And so I, I did hit a point then where I shifted over into environmental reporting during the BP oil disaster in 2010. And uh, and then it was that was kind of my transition. I knew I wanted to get back in and start doing environmental and then ultimately climate reportage. And so that kind of started me on the trajectory. And then I, I started working on this book uh, in earnest in, in late 2015. Um, in your once you sort of once you took on all of these trips, how did you. Uh, how did you identify your effectively your guides through each of these uh, unique and specific terrains and um, and challenges, if you will? How did you figure out sort of who your subjects would be or who your companions would be as you explored each of these individual suspect subjects? Yeah, it, it wasn't entirely a scientific process in that I uh, some of the people I found was literally through reading different scientific studies. That's how I found the uh, Nathan Stevenson, the USGS uh, forester that I went to Sequoia National Park with. I have a whole chapter on trees. Uh, and, and so some of it was literally just reading the studies and then finding the scientists and, 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 and contacting them that way. And then uh, some of it was a lot less uh, uh, formal in that where just for Alaska, for example, I asked some of my climbing buddies, hey, do you know any glaciologists up here? And, and literally asking rangers that I was working with at Denali National Park, uh, who's who's doing the studying up here, because I know that they have to be affiliated to the National Park Service. And then th through friends of friends, I found some of some of these folks. So it was it was, you know, those two those two extremes and then kind of everything in between. But, it you know, again, I got very lucky in, in being able to go out to places like Glacier National Park with Dr. Dan Fagri. Um, you know, really an internationally known, highly esteemed glaciologist who's authored 
so many sci lead scientific studies uh, and, and, and people like Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, who I mentioned earlier, um, it was it was really one of the biggest gifts and greatest experiences I had working on this book was getting to go out into the field with some of these people and then bringing their words and oftentimes their emotions in to my writing about it, too, which which uh, um, really helped me understand better. I think the the depths of the crisis, not just having my own experience, but then watching these people who most of them had been studying these areas for anywhere between 20 and 50 years. I mean, Dr. Lovejoy has been studying the Amazon literally longer than I've been alive. So that was the other thing is I wanted to find people who had long-term intimate relationships with the places that they were studying. And, and I had, and, I, and that was another of my criteria for choosing some of the places. I wanted to go back to places like Denali, where the first time I had been on the mountain was 1997, and then was up there just about every year between then and 2003, and then going back in 2016 and watching these dramatic changes over a very short time frame. Same experience with the Great Barrier Reef in Australia or Palau, where I also went in Micronesia for my coral chapter. So um, having my own long-term relationship with some of these places, but then making it a point to go out there with some of these scientists who had had much, much longer relationships with these places um, and it could speak to that change over over decades is there obviously you um, this this investigation sort of con it has given birth to a very personal um, and very passionate uh, book for you um, I wonder if there's a any of the places that you visited if you were to take our audience with you to one, place um, to sort of to, to lock in in sort of an in-body way the core message of the book. Um, what one place on the globe would you take us to sort of make your case? And what was it about being there um, that perhaps sort of really dropped in um, the message that it's time for an urgent intervention for you? Yeah, I I think, um, gosh, it, it's a it's a tough question in that I I, I had really profound spirit experiences in most of the places where I went for the book. Um, but I, I think one thing that comes to mind um, when you asked me that was uh, um, the town Utkiagvik, the town formerly known as Barrow, Alaska. It's the northernmost town in the United States. And I got to go up there and I was watching literally, you know, it's a, it's a village, it's an Alaskan village on permafrost as so many of all of them up in the northern regions are. And so it was literally uh, the, 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 the ground was literally thawing out from under them and roads were being changed and structures were starting to tilt. And it's one of numerous villages up there that's going to have to be completely relocated uh, from the thawing permafrost simultaneously with the Arctic Ocean now encroaching further and further every year into the village area where because of the thawing, but then also because of the, the sea ice in the Arctic Ocean is is melting away. More of that open ocean is 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 exposed to wind events and storms. So now all of a sudden there are these big waves that didn't exist when there used to be a fuller ice pack. And so that wave action was also uh, accelerating the, the demise of the shore and, and it was uh, you know, taking a lot of the, you know, encroaching closer and closer into the village. And so, you know, one one experience that I had there was I got to speak with Wesley Aiken, the village elder. He was 92 years old when I met with him. So this is someone who literally grew up using dog sleds, you know, literally grew up there in a completely different world, uh, whaling, uh, hunting seals, things like this. There was, you know, little mechanization to speak of. And he'd seen he talked to me about all of the change and he he literally just said uh, all of the ice is melting. And, and, and to him, that meant not just physically watching this ice melt, but their entire culture and their entire way of life melting away with it. Because like indigenous populations everywhere, um, subsistence living is tied to their spiritual beliefs, to their culture, to how they raise their youth, to how they teach, to everything. It's all the same thing. There's not a differentiation. So when these huge earth changes start to take away their way of life, it's, it's taking away all of those things. And um, 
really, he said, um, one of the quotes that I, I, I want to um, read to him that was re a really, really powerful moment to me is uh, he, he was very soft spoken and he spoke very, very slowly. And he says, it's all changing. Some people from the lower 48 and the rest of the world are worrying about us. But I don't know why, because we are not worried. We know this is happening. People before me were telling us this was going to happen. They knew. I don't know how they knew, but they knew. I listened to them. Then it started to happen. And now I just know it's happening and I don't think it's going to stop. All of us watching now are taking their chance to make sure we plug a, a question in. Um, while you're formulating um, uh, a follow on to that, uh, I certainly in his in that quote, there's an incredible resignation um, and uh, and a certain uh, an acceptance of an inevitability, um, which is. You know, I think I think uh, maybe some of us uh, like Westerners uh, uh, or folks in the lower 48 uh have this feeling that we should be resisting and that we should be more actively um, sort of kicking against the inevitability and, and yet we're paralyzed in, in action. So I, it's, it's interesting first to <clears throat> acknowledge uh, the sort of profound acceptance in, in the statement that you just read, but also um, almost a willingness to sort of give over to the inevitability of it. Did you find um, among other folks that you spoke to in that specific context, for instance, um, more of an active spirit of resistance um, toward what was happening in the village? Um, or um, was that sort of a dominant characteristic there, just this sense that, um, that this change is inevitable and beyond their ability to respond? Uh, it was really a bit of both in that there, there was this acceptance that they, you know, these people, more than uh, those of us living in cities and not living is, is, is closely tied to the planet or being reliant on subsistence lifestyles, for example, for food and um, the way that, uh, that culture and spiritual beliefs are, are practiced. Um, they, they have been watching these changes for decades. And I think that was part of what Mr. Aiken meant when he talked, look, we, you know, people are worried about us, but we've been seeing this forever coming. And so we're not surprised. And so there was an acceptance, but then alongside that, for example, on St. Paul Island in the Bering Sea of Alaska, where I also went for the book to really focus specifically on, I, I did a whole chapter just on how indigenous people are being impacted by this, because they're, they're some, some of the population of the planet who are taking this crisis the, the most intensely and the earliest, like right on the chin. And, and it was there I saw that, that there was sort of this acceptance and sometimes the reg resignation of these dramatic changes and what this means for us as a people that we might not even be able to continue out here. But alongside that was uh, a, a deep desire and drive to go deeper into their lifestyles. And so when I was out there, for example, there was a woman, actually one of the, wasn't the tribal leader, but but definitely within the tribal government who uh, was actively teaching younger people the Anungan language uh, or the Anungan, the original name, what is usually more commonly referred to as Aleutians. Uh, she was touched teaching young people the language. And I walked into a room where people were, you know, practicing songs and, and, and learning the language because they knew that it was a big problem of how many people were leaving, leaving the island of just 234 souls. And it was mostly the younger people that were wanting to leave. So they kind of had redoubled their efforts in, in, in teaching them subsistence hunting and subsistence lifestyles, and especially the language, because they were acutely aware that if the language goes, then um, so much of our culture and teaching is going to go. So there was also, alongside that acceptance, really this almost fiercer tenacity to, we will maintain these traditions. And that's also not surprising when we consider, especially looking at indigenous populations across uh, the rest of the United States, where, you know, there was, these are people who've already survived the near total genocide by the U.S. government. Uh, they already had survived having 
smallpox blankets and biological warfare used against them. So they, you know, there is a, a deeper inner core strength that, you know, even something as big as the climate crisis, uh, they're not going to just fold and walk away. They're going to, they're going to dig in and live closer to the earth. And, and these are, these are the types of people. And this is where my next work is taking me because these are the people that have a wisdom that especially now with all of these converging crises, the climate crisis, COVID-19, economic crisis, the crisis of an authoritarian regime now in the United States, that we're going to all need to be digging really, really deeply and finding ways to live that much more closely to the earth uh, to, to get through this time and not even looking at into the future, but just how to be during this time. And that was, that was a really profound thing that I saw in the indigenous place, in the uh, indigenous villages, like in Alaska that I went to that we've been talking about that, uh, just like indigenous populations in other places around the United States, that these are the people that have a really good idea of how to be during this time. We have a question from Paul Johnson. It says, are you familiar with degrowth theory? Proponents of degrowth argue that a plan reduction of throughput can be accomplished in high income nations while at the same time maintaining and even improving people's standards of living. Policy proposals focus on redistributing existing income, shortening the work week, and introducing a job guarantee and a living wage while expanding access to public goods. I'm curious your thoughts on this approach to tackling climate change. Thank you. I, I think that's a great, yeah, I, I am not intimately, but at least somewhat familiar with uh, degrowth. And, and you know, it's, it's right now it's forced upon us, right? I mean, to, to a large degree where, you know, flying's out, transport of goods is being disrupted, availability of things is disrupted, and it's really forcing all of us kind of into the degrowth paradigm. And, and look at what's happening on the planet where CO2 emissions have plummeted uh, places that have always been he so heavily polluted by the in industrial growth society, like um, some of the major rivers in India. Many of us have probably seen the video of the, the, the clearing of the canals in Venice for the first time in people's lifetimes. They're pollution free, uh, even right here where I live. And I think many people, regardless of where you live, can look out the window and see the difference in air pollution. And I mean, I, I live on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington and I've had days here where it's so clear I can see further up into Canada than I've ever seen since I've lived here. Um, these are these are immediate, pro pretty profound results of what happens. And and if there is a one of the sil silver linings to this crisis is that it's showing us that uh, we have to learn how to live with less, and we have to learn how to live slower and more simply and more in concert with the rhythms of the earth. And I think all of that ties directly into to degrowth. And in fact, it's it's mandatory at this point. Um, like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, this idea that people think, oh, we're going to go back to normal or go back to how it was before COVID-19, the global pandemic. Um, that's basically not going to happen. And, and, and we're reading a lot about that now. And I would argue that um, it shouldn't happen because what was happening before was quite literally lethal to the planet. I mean, that, that in a, a span of just a, a couple of hundred very short years since the Industrial Revolution kicked into full swing, we've rendered parts of the planet uninhabitable and literally are at a point where uh, uh, our, the, the, the continuance of our own species is possibly in question. And indigenous people that lived here for millennia did not have this problem. They did not force a crisis like this. And, and uh, so the only way I think forward at this point is to start with, okay, what are the habits that this, this, this situation that's been forced upon us now, which is exactly the kind of response, like I said, that we should have been having to the climate crisis as soon as we knew how severe it was and how far off the cliff we already are, that this is the type of full-scale global response we should have been having. So the question is now, what are each one of us going to do to carry forward as things eventually start opening back up some, not that they're going to go back to, to normal as they were before, but when the pace does start to pick back up, what lessons are we going to take from this time that we're in right now of degrowth and slowing down 
and in, in many cases being forced to come to a dead stop. And we need to look inside and I think find these lessons and remember them for uh, when things start to ramp up again in the future. I have another question here that's not attributed. Um, it says indigenous people are driven by and informed by their faith. And this questioner wonders if you have that as well, or if you were looking at our predicament from a more purely scientific perspective, uh, to paraphrase, what informs your passion? Um, I think really the best way I can articulate that is is to kind of come back around to when it was actually a, a Native American elder who who reminded me of that difference between uh, rights versus obligations. And I think it's it's to me is is if if my two primary obligations, which I, I, I have adopted those as my own since I first heard that. Uh, if my two primary obligations are to serve future generations of all species and the planet and take care of the planet the best way that I can, then no matter what is happening and no matter how far along in this climate crisis we are, and, and you know, it, by the time I got to the end of my book, I, I deeply understood that we are probably even beyond even mitigating much of the crisis. It's really all about adaptation at this point that no matter how dire things look, I have these obligations. And, you know, another way to look at it is uh, a, a, another thing that I, I, I came across that I brought into my book was kind of asking yourself this question is, um, assuming that uh, I get to live another 30, 40 years uh, and I'm on my deathbed, and let's say that there's uh, a young person at that time, maybe say, you know, eight, 10 years old comes up and, and says, wow, you were alive in 2020 when there was still Arctic sea ice in the summers. There was most of the ice was still on Greenland. Um, you know, all these other things were still there was still some of the Amazon rainforest left. Um, you know, did you know what was happening on the planet in 2020? And of course, uh, any of us alive today would have to say, yes, absolutely. I was uh, acutely aware of what was happening on the planet. And then, of course, that begs the next question is, well, what did you do? And so uh, the only way to answer that question, the way that I want to be able to answer it is, uh, is, 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 you know, putting that back on myself today, which is, uh, what am I going to do today to serve? Dar, I want to thank you, uh, and I want to thank you for, um, I, I feel like we're fortunate to have had the opportunity to um, hear you speak about the book um, pre-COVID and now from the midst of this crisis. Um, uh, it's really um, bracing and, um, and uh, clarifying, and so thank you so much for coming back and, and sharing not just what you've learned, but um, your passion with us. Um, I want to encourage everybody who's interested in uh, learning more about the book to pick up a copy from third place on our Crowdcast page. And I want to ask you all to check out townhallseattle.org for all of the upcoming live streams on our calendar. It's um, Things are almost as brisk online as they are in our building at this point. So we hope you, uh, you'll you stay close to us in the coming weeks. And um, we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you for joining us tonight. Good night.